I'd like to welcome every one of us in this session of uh, our panel discussion and uh, looking at uh, various issues that uh, we have outlined in this conference. And uh, I pray that uh, the Lord may continue uh, guiding us daily more so in this week as uh, we go through this panel discussion. It is not uh, a preaching, it is discussing. And uh, today, uh, day one, we, we have a session which shall be running for the whole week. Uh, in this conference session, in this day one, we are discussing about uh, possible interpolations of Matthew chapter 28, verses 19, and uh, uh, 1 John, verse 5 and 7. And so I'll try my best to moderate as uh, I welcome your views or on the two texts in the Bible and how you view them, how you understand them, and uh, the history of, uh, uh, of those texts. And so I'd like us to pray, and then uh, we shall be able to go into the discussion. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, thank you. You have given us time again to meet us, brethren, that uh, we may share in your word. And uh, we pray that the Spirit may continue guiding and leading us above all. Heavenly Father, we ask of the spirit of humility, that which we do not understand, help us to uh, seek thee in prayer that we may continue understanding. And uh, these things may uh, help us grow in our character and not just have information. Lord, we pray that uh, you will uh, be our teacher in everything. In Christ Jesus' name, we ask of these things. Amen. Amen. And so uh, we have already lost like uh, uh, 26 minutes. And uh, we, we can just start with uh, the book of uh, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Uh, just uh, to uh, maybe give a brief introduction. Uh, when you look at uh, the book of Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, sometimes we have to understand what uh, uh, it is saying rather than uh, 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 putting a meaning in the text itself. And so as uh, we study the word of God, we look for uh, possible places that um, the word uh, uh, may be. Uh, um, with what we believe, can it be possible to be harmonized with uh, the other uh, uh, the other passages in the scripture without destroying uh, the truth that uh, is being revealed uh, uh, there? One thing when you read the book of Matthew chapter 28 verse 19, you come to realize of the triad nature of the book. When we talk about triads, it is um, a list of um, uh, uh, three uh, uh, three people or three things or three concepts listed together. Uh, and so when you look at uh, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, it is not the only place where we have uh, a triad used in the gospel of Matthew. Uh, in the genealogy of Jesus, in the book of Matthew chapter 1, verses 1, we are faced with a triad also, and uh, I hope uh, that uh, we will have uh, uh, our Bibles. And so uh, the book of Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, uh, you look at uh, Matthew 1, 1, it says the book of generation of Jesus Christ, that is one, the son of David, two, the son of Abraham. You, you look at that and you find that triad. And uh, when you go to 
uh, uh, continue reading verses 2 to 17, you find so many triads uh, are written in the book of Geonology. Also, when you look at uh, uh, Matthew chapter 1, verses 20, uh, you find that uh, Gabriel comes three times to uh, Joseph. Gabriel comes three times to Joseph. But when he thought, and this is behold, the Lord appeared unto him and him, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not, take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is a holy ghost. Verses um, chapter 2, verses 13. Uh, repeats, and when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy. And then when you read uh, uh, verse 19, but when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. And so you will find many triads in the book of Matthew and uh, Matthew chapter 28 verses 19 is not an exception of the triad. Uh, you look at um, Matthew chapter 2 verses 11 and when they were come into the house they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him and when they had opened their treasures they presented unto him gifts gold and frankincense and Maya another triad you find in the book of Matthew, uh, 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 the book of Matthew, and uh, also when you look at the temptations of Jesus Christ, they are in triads in the book of Matthew, chapter 4, verses 11. Uh, uh, when you look at the whole ministry of Jesus Christ in the book of Matthew, chapter 4, it also comes of the triad of teaching, preaching, and healing. And so you find these three in one connections all over the synoptic gospel of Matthew. And so as uh, I just welcome uh, 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 your, your views on, the, on this uh, passage that we are talking about, I want us to open up and be able to freely discuss what you think and uh, how you can the verse and the, uh, such a things. And so uh, may the Lord continue guiding us as we discuss these things. Welcome. We are welcome to give our views on the text of uh, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Maybe as uh, people continue thinking uh, and uh, opening up on uh, what they think about the text, uh, I was just talking about the triads that you find in the book of Matthew. And um, also uh, another thing that I'd like to point to is uh, uh, Matthew 6, uh, 31. Uh, there's also uh, another triad you will find uh, that um, therefore take no thought saying what we shall eat, what we shall drink uh, with all shall be clothes. This is, these are three things put together and interconnected. And um, when they are connected like this, it, they don't actually, uh, 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 they don't actually uh, uh, destroy the meaning of the text. And so, uh, Also, something that um, uh, uh, we find is uh, in uh, in the book of uh, Matthew chapter seventeen, 
verses 25, uh, Peter asking three questions. I'm just talking about the triads that uh, are found in the book of Matthew. And so uh, it is uh, not something so peculiar or something that really destroys the gospel uh, when uh, we find uh, uh, the book of Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 written so. But uh, my question is that, uh, do we have an, any evidence that, um, uh, uh, that actually Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 is an interpolation and it's not an original text to be found in the Bible. Any, any idea? Hello. Brother Timothy, welcome. Okay, uh, good evening. Good evening uh, just studying uh, an observation. Uh, yes. I think uh, not, not uh, I think uh, I only have one positive uh, proof that uh, it, it, might, it, it is not an interpolation. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, as I find it in the writings of Viji White, I find it quoted uh, word for word. And so yes. just from that observation that E.G. White quotes it. And uh, so for me, that is a proof po positive that uh, Matthew 28 verse 18 is not an interpolation, but it was recorded there as as God willed it. And as such, uh, I, I find uh, like so far no problem with it. Like the rules of Bible interpretation held in place, I, uh, I, I've found no problem with it so far. Okay, that's all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And um, uh, I like I'd like just to add uh, something that uh, may help us to uh, 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 welcome Elder Kimaru. I just want to say something that also may help us. Maybe another way to look at um, the, the text is uh, to compare it uh, with other synoptic gospels. Do they really uh, match with uh, what is recorded in the book of Matthew? chapter 28 verse 19 i don't know if um, because I, I believe that uh, uh, the great commission was given in the in, in the gospels in the synoptic gospels not only in matthew but uh, in other places and so one thing that uh, we may ask ourselves is it also uh, does it appear like that in other synoptic gospels? Does it appear uh, like that in other synoptic gospels? It will be it will be good to look at, uh, uh, as I say. Maybe we can look at uh, Matthew chapter 24, verses 45 to 49. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, verses uh, 45 to 49. Look at... Uh, another way that uh, Christ tells them about this. And uh, remember how I began by saying that the triads really appear in the book of Matthew. It is not just in, uh, in the book of uh, 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 Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, but we find other triads in the book of Matthew. And this helps us uh, to have a basis of uh, what we are talking about. <clears throat> 
looking at the Great Commission in other uh, Synoptic Gospels, uh, this is uh, Matthew chapter 24, verses 45 to uh, 49. Then open he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. This is Jesus Christ. And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. Verse 49, and behold, I send the promise of the, uh, of the Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until ye, ye be endured with the power from on high. So we see Jesus Christ speaking, and then he talks about the power uh, he talks about the Father and the power of the Father. This is just the same as the book of Acts chapter 1, verse 8. If you look at the book of Acts chapter 1, verses 8, uh, we are told that, um, uh, but you shall receive power after that Holy Ghost is ca come upon you and you shall be witnesses uh, um, unto me both in Jerusalem and in, in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of uh, uh, of the uh, earth. And so uh, he, he tells them that wait for me in Jerusalem that I might give you the promise of the Father. So you find Jesus Christ, you find the Father and the promise of the Father, which is the Holy Spirit, uh, which means that uh, the salvation of men is hinged upon these three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so uh, that is another thing that uh, I might just want to add on that in uh, the book of Matthew chapter 28, verses 19. Is there any question or any additions? Is uh, Elder Maru speaking? Because I see. Uh, not... Okay. Okay. Then uh, uh, I'll just add uh, some information. Uh, I, I didn't uh, think that uh, I'll be taking the most part in speaking, but uh, I'll try to hear your views. A question then is uh, uh, really asked, how should we understand Matthew chapter 8, verse 19? The final words of Jesus in this gospel uh, account uh, 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 the last uh, three verses, the Great Commission. The Great Commission itself is sandwiched between two statements from Jesus from which it takes it is impetus. The Great Commission actually is surrounded by, by verse 18 and verse 20. Go ye into the world. Uh, no, all authority has been given me in heaven and on earth. And then there is that uh, Great co Commission. And then he in verse 20 says that, and lo, I am with you until the end of um, uh, the time. And so this is interesting to think that uh, actually it is like um, a, 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 a chiastic structure where actually the, uh, the, the two verses uh, before and after the verse that we are looking uh, at actually helps us to understand the weight of uh, the verse that we are speaking about. So. In the introduction, verses 18, Matthew chapter 8, verse 18, Jesus says that all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. And then he says that go ye and baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then the last verse says that, and lo, I am with you. And so 
this verse 19 uh, gets it is impetus from uh, the, the two other verses that we have been given, which means that, um, uh, and when I talk about the impetus, um, verse 18 and uh, uh, verses 19 being given impetus by, by verses uh, 18 and 19, I, I just read something in the book of uh, Mark, the book of Mark, the parting words of Jesus Christ also to see how he parts from his disciples in the book of Mark chapter 16, the book of Mark chapter 16. Uh, uh, from verse 15, it says, and he said unto them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. This, um, uh, this sounds like the great commission going into the world in Matthew chapter 28. Um, uh, and he said, go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So the question we should ask in the great commission in the book of Mark chapter 16, the, the question should be believe on what? Because in Matthew chapter 28, we find that in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the book of Matthew chapter 24, verses 45 to 49, we find the three also mentioned, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But in Mark chapter 16, it only says, if you believe. Believe on what? And uh, 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 this can be borrowed from other synoptic gospel where actually Jesus Christ in another way of leaving his disciples in the book of John chapter 14, he says that believe, uh, believe in the father, look at John chapter 14, John chapter 14, he says that let not your heart be troubled, ye believe in God, believe also in me. So when he is giving the great commission in the book of Mark chapter 16, uh, he says, believe. But in John chapter 16, he says, in John chapter 14, he says, believe in God and also believe in me. But we know that um, uh, John chapter 14 to John chapter 17 is the promise of the comforter. And so also you find the father in John chapter 14, you find the son and the promise of the comforter. And so we are trying to look at the possible relationship that uh, Matthew chapter 28 verse 19 have on other gospel. And if by believing in it, we really destroy other synoptic gospels. But um, so far we find that um, actually um, since Sister White, since Sister White used the verse, then we have to accept that it was used according to inspiration. But if if we have to deal with the, uh, the Sunday keepers, we have to see the possible relationship that Matthew chapter 28 verse 19 has with other synoptic gospel. And if the triad is also used in some other parts. Uh, I will welcome if anyone has anything or question to ask. I'm just moderating. I'm not teaching. You are welcome. What are the possible ways of understanding the book of Matthew chapter 28 verse 19? What difficulties do you find to harmonize with the other synoptic gospel? Let us not even go to the book of Acts first. How do you reconcile with the other great commission in the book of uh, Luke chapter 24 verses 45 and 20, 49 and then the book of Mark chapter 16? Uh, let, allow me to finish the book of Mark chapter 16. And he said, uh, unto them go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. This sounds like uh, 28, 19 of Matthew. He that believeth, believeth on what? The Father and the Son. Believe in God, also believe in me, and I'll send you the comforter. Uh, uh, he that believeth shall not be damned, and this son shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues. 
they shall take up serpents, and if they bring any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. And then look at uh, verses uh, 19 and 20. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received unto heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following Amen. And so when that uh, uh, verse 20 is actually uh, 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 in correlation with, uh, 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 with verse 20 of Matthew chapter 28. When you look at Mark chapter 16, verse 20, you find it fitting very well with the book of uh, Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. Lo, I am with you till the end of the war age. And here in 20, it says that uh, the Lord working with them and confirming it by signs. And so you find that the triads are repeated in the gospel, synoptic gospels. And uh, uh, when you read Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, it really doesn't uh, 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 destroy the other synoptic gospels uh, and their great commission. Uh, any views? Hello. Yes. Hello. Oh, Welcome. Uh, okay. I love how uh, we are connecting it with the synoptic gospel, but uh, uh, brother Timothy, I, I think I'm losing you, brother Tim. I think we have lost Brother Timo a lot, what he was saying. It's about in Corinthians, which is uh, about like has something like the triad form. Yes. I, I think we lost uh, Brother Timothy Okinye. Brother Kefa, Elder Kefa, are you there? You are saying something? We lost so much about Brother Timothy Okinye and what he was saying. I don't know if uh, Elder Kefa was saying something. Hello and good evening. Good evening to you. Okay, uh, I was actually, uh, I've joined late, so I didn't follow from the beginning, but I think I'm on following so that I can also compute later. Who, who am I speaking to? I just see Tino. Is that Brother Ngasa? It was Kefa speaking. Oh, it was Kefa speaking. Oh, thank you. Maybe as uh, we look at uh, the, the, the issue of uh, Matthew chapter 28, verses 19, uh, I want to throw some challenge to us also, because you find in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, it says, uh, but in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, I, I want to throw at you something so that um, maybe it may expand uh, uh, our thinking. Uh, in the screen, you want us to interact. Can we see the screen? Yeah. Okay, look at this. 
in uh, Australasian uh, uh, um, uh, uh, recorder, Australian conference record. Now, this one is the quote that really comes closest to actually what Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. I hope that we have seen this quote before. The Godhead was stirred with pity for the rest, and the, uh, the Son and the Holy Spirit gave themselves to the working out of the plan of redemption. In order to fully carry out this plan, it was decided that Christ, the only begotten Son of God, should give himself a friend for him. What line uh, can measure the depth of this love? Uh, I just want to uh, throw uh, at you this and ask Do you see? the same phraseology being used here also matching in the book of Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. This is a quote that can really solve Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. <clears throat> We are in a panel discussion. Can someone say something on this quote in connection with Matthew chapter 28, verse 19? Oh, the Cyprian is speaking, but we can't get you. Cyprian, are you there? I'm in class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people have uh, decided to keep silent on me. Uh, how, if you are faced today with somebody to explain now these quotes, I'd like to hear from you. How will you maybe how will you explain this? Yeah. The cafe is speaking. We can hear. Not, not really. <laughs> I am not. Really. How do you explain, Elder, this quote? The Godhead will start with pity for the race and the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit of themselves. And do you see any interconnection with Matthew chapter 8, verse 15? Uh, now, if, I, if I'm, I'm facing the question to explain that, I think uh, uh, I'll I'll start because according to this statement, it is showing that maybe the Holy Spirit is another, it's another person because they, it's trying to show us that we have three persons as the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. So my, I think I would be stuck because uh, 
of the third person, I'm saying that that's the Holy Spirit, who gave themselves. Because if they gave themselves and there were three as the statement embraced, then uh, I think uh, some extra I'll be stuck. <laughs> With this one. This is an original quote. This is an original quote in uh, Hawaii. Uh, I think some of the quotes that uh, we should look at at uh, some later stage. And uh, you know that um, uh, the, the only reason that uh, I can give, or uh, somehow the way I can explain this quote is uh, that everyone to where you find that the Father, the source of everything, the source of all divinity, and then he gives to the Son, and then the Son, the title of beneficence, gives to us the Holy Spirit. And uh, 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 the whole divinity gave it uh, uh, themselves, or uh, the whole divine divinity was given to the redemption plan. That, that means that there is nothing that the Father withheld from himself. He gave himself uh, in the Son, because you understand in First Corinthians, uh, uh, is it uh, Second Corinthians chapter five, verse nineteen? For to it, God was in Christ reconciling with His Son, and then the Son, in Son, gave the choices gift according to John chapter and give a free spirit and the Holy Spirit is what uh, has been given unto us for the for redemption. And when you read uh, uh, Hebrews 9.14, we are told uh, that uh, Christ overcame by that eternal uh, spirit. And so uh, this word came in a way, not meaning three persons uh, per se, but actually the Father who has all the divinity, giving himself. There's nothing that uh, really he will have. Uh, I see the quote time in very well because we have the Father, we have the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which means that uh, you believe in the Father, you believe in the Son, and you believe in the omnipresent power, uh, Holy Spirit. But back to Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, maybe one thing that uh, I need us to look at is uh, the chiastic structure of uh, the chiastic structure of this verse. Um, chiastic structure is where us is around the other is actually there is the point that is being made. So we have the PCD. Uh, and then uh, from up, and then the ABCD from down of the same as in this is the focal point that you are looking at. And so, uh, and Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given me. B, go ye therefore, point number C, and make disciples all of all nations. Point number D, baptizing them. When you come from below and behold, I am with you all to the end of the age, all that I command you to observe teaching them. And so Christ is the one involved in this thing, but the other part now it is the father being involved. So at the upper part, we have the father. At the lower part, we have uh, uh, Jesus Christ at two human beings. But in the midst of the chaotic structure, you have now the Holy Spirit included because you have a personal being, you have the Son personal being, but we have the Holy Spirit here on the present. So in this chaotic structure, you see the Father, you see the Son, but you don't see anything with the Holy Spirit being a person or a being. But now, when you come to the focal point in the Middle East, you find the Holy Spirit being the connection of the Holy Spirit is to be with them. And because the Holy Spirit is not that being, 
uh, in the book of Mark chapter 16, we find Christ saying that uh, Christ being with the host, confirming the word and the sign. And then in Mark chapter 28, verse 20, we find that uh, Christ is with them till the end of the age. And so in this uh, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, you have the Father, you have the Son, and then in the Mideast, you, you have their omnipresence, which is working uh, 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 on the earth. And so uh, there is no connection of um, the authority of the Holy Spirit working as the Father and the Son, but actually their economical presence where they are not. But the Father is in heaven, and then the Son is going to heaven, and he says that I am you always. And so while you are, you, you are going through Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, you come to understand something, that here is the Father, he has given the authority to the Son, and then the son has been on earth, but he's going away. And what does he bring in the mix as he's going away? It is the Holy Spirit. Now, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 really marries very well with John chapter 14 and verses John chapter 16, because uh, as the son goes to the father, he brings in the promise of the father, which is the Holy Spirit. And so, uh, the issue I know is uh, now, is it a liturgy? Is Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, a liturgy? Uh, when we say that uh, baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Is it wrong? Uh, and uh, I know we have established that uh, it is not an interpolation, unless somebody can give an evidence that uh, it is an interpolation. What difficulty do you find there in baptizing in the very words of Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, as we conclude and go to first John chapter 5, verse 7? Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Ah, uh, jambo uh, ambalo nigetaka kusugumza hapa ni ya kwamba ah hakuna uzito wa water ama hakuna makosa yote ya kutumia hiyo majina. Hata igawa tunaona ya kwamba mitume hawakuweza kuyatumia ni kwa sababu waliweza kuelewa ni nini ambacho Yesu alikuwa anasugumzia. Kwa sababu tunapoangalia katika Biblia Yesu alipokuwa anasugumza na mitume wake katika kitabu cha Yohana 14 wakati Philip anamwambia ya kwamba awaonyeshe baba anawauliza kwani nimekaa na nyinyi na hujanielewa mimi na kwa hivyo akasema ya kwamba aliyeniona amenimuona baba alafu hapo hapo katika madhayo hiyo hiyo katika Yohana 14 hiyo fungu lake la 18 na 17 na 18 anawaahidi ya kwamba nitaenda mimi ambaye nilikuwa nimekaa nanyi na nitakuja kukaa ndani yenu kwa hivyo anatuonyesha ya kwamba ba ba ako ndani yake na yeye die roho atakaye kuja na kwa hivyo tunaona ya kwamba uh, mitume wakaweza kuelewa ya kwamba kulingana na akolosai wa kolosai bili fungu lake ni la 9 ningependa uh, kuinuku uh, kidogo uh, katika kitabu cha wa kolosai bili na fungu lake ni la 9 uh, Dugu wetu Paolo kuna kitu anasugunza pale bayo kinaweza kutusaidia uh, sana katika Wakolosai bili na fungu lake ni la tisa. Uh, kulingana na lile fungu ambalo uh, tumesoma katika roho ya unabii uh, katika bili fungu la tisa inasema ya kwamba 
For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Na ametusugumzia kuhusu Godhead. Na tunaona ya kwamba Godhead inasugumzia juu ya Yesu akisimamia baba na akisimamia roho mtakatifu. Kwa hivyo tunaona ya kwamba mitume wakaelewa wakati ambapo alikuwa anawasugumzia katika kubatiza katika lile jina aliwasugumzia kubatiza katika jina lake akiwa anasimamia baba na anasimamia roho mtakatifu kwa hivyo kutaja maneno ya kwamba uh, nimembatiza katika jina la baba mwana na roho mtakatifu haina makosa ikiwa hauna jambo la utatu ndani ya mawazo yako na wakati mwingine ninaona ya kwamba uh, inakuwa labda uh, inalete confusion kwa wale ambao wanaamini miugu mitatu wanaposikia ukitaja haya matatu hawaelewi wanaelewa kuligana na vile wanavyopenda na kuligana na mapenzi yao kwa hiyo tunaona ya kwamba sio vimbaya kwa sababu hakuna makosa pale lakini kwa sababu labda ya kuleta ya kuleta eh, kuleta shinda ni vizuri kutumia jina la Yesu kwa sababu ni sawa kwa sababu neno la Mungu limeweza kuruhusu kwa hivyo hakuna makosa ya kutumia uh, ile uh, Mungu Baba Mwana na Roho Mtakatifu na pia kutumia jina la Yesu Kristo kwa sababu yeye yeah, yeah, die the fullness of Godhead Thank you so much Elder Kimaru before someone else uh, uh, speaks before maybe someone else uh, uh, speaks um, let us look at the verse Matthew chapter 28 verse 19, 19 again go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost Now, something that we should ask ourselves is father a proper name or a description of somebody? Is son a proper name or is the Holy Spirit a proper name? There is no proper name in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. That, that one we should realize that there is nothing like father being a proper name or son being a proper name or the Holy Spirit. Holy Ghost being a proper name. They are descriptive of uh, the offices they hold. And so the, the, the word name yeah. as used in Greek at such a place actually only means power and authority. So when you are baptizing, you are not baptizing yes. in three different names, but actually you are baptizing into authority authority and power of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so uh, we shouldn't stumble also. Uh, these are just my views. There should be no stumbling on the issue of the name, because here proper name is not given. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are not proper names, but descriptive of who they are. In fact, If there is any verse that can prove Jesus Christ is the Son of God, it is Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, because it says clearly the Father, the Son, and we have to ask whose Son, not Mary's Son or Joseph's Son, and the Holy Spirit. And now we have to ask uh, ourselves whose Spirit that are we doing this. So you find that uh, there is no proper name in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 when you are baptizing, but you are baptizing in the authority of the Father and the power of the Son and the Holy Spirit to be able to overcome sin. That is what I just wanted uh, to pass along. Daniel Makini, yes. uh, welcome. You haven't said anything so far, Brother Manuel Makini. Uh, and uh, welcome, Brother Felix Owiti Minan. Yes, Brother Makini. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh I'm trying to think of this verse, uh, this baptism, I think, uh, can, can I be heard? Yes, we can hear you clearly. Okay, so I'm trying to, I've been thinking for a while concerning uh, the baptism of John, and I'm trying to compare this baptism 
of Matthew 28, verse 19, uh, with the baptism of John. Uh, uh, a verse that comes in mind is uh, Acts, I believe it's Acts chapter 19, concerning the disciples who are at Ephesus. For us to be able to understand Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, we need to understand this, these disciples whom Christ is speaking to these words were with Christ in the upper room. These disciples had understood what uh, the comforter was which Christ was talking about. So the disciples really understood the words of Christ. Now the question is to us, do we, uh, have we understood what Christ was talking about in the upper room? I believe if we, uh, if, if, if the Christian world understood that discourse in, Matthew, in John chapter 13, up to John chapter 17, we could have been in a better position starting Matthew 28 verse 19. So uh, my question will be, uh, this baptism of Christ, is it in any way comparable to the baptism of John or is there something, is there a slight difference? That, that was my question, yeah. Can we just compare the two baptisms? The John's baptism and uh, the baptism is created by Christ. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Brother McKinney. Uh, and uh, you have opened up a good, uh, 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 good uh, 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 dialogue. Can we compare the baptism that... Uh, Okay, Cyprian is asking, let those who are not speaking kindly mute their mics. We have some background noise. Okay, if you are not speaking, then you can mute your microphone. Thank you, Brother Cyprian. Uh, Brother McKinney, I, I like to, uh, in a connection with what you have brought about, was the baptism of uh, John different <laughs> from the baptism that the the apostles who are actually doing. And uh, you have pointed out the book of uh, Acts chapter 19, which we really, all of us understand that Paul went about and made some disciples who are the disciples of John. And uh, he asked them, uh, 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 did you, were you baptized? Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you were baptized? And they said, we have never heard something called, something of sort called the Holy Spirit. And then, uh, he was able to baptize them, and then they received the, the Holy Spirit. And so it seems kind of, or it is apparent that uh, um, Paul was able to retell them the position or the place of the Holy Spirit in baptism, because he could not just baptize them without now telling them about the position or uh, the place of the Holy Spirit. And so Acts chapter 19 actually gives us a glimpse that uh, John's baptism, is, uh, we are told that it was baptism to repentance, saying that uh, 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 the kingdom of God is at hand, repent ye. But it didn't go beyond that. Although the teachings of John and Jesus Christ were not different, but there are some things that John did not mention in his baptism or uh, uh, while he was teaching. And so uh, his disciples never understood the issue of the Holy Spirit. So Paul has to tell them that, look here, there is the position of the Holy Spirit or the place of uh, the Holy Spirit. And if you will be baptized, you have to understand it. And then after relating to them about the Holy Spirit, they are baptized and they receive the Holy Spirit. They speak in different tongues. Another issue, maybe Brother McKinney, I'd like to point to John chapter chapter three, John chapter three, verse 22, verse 26. Now look at what it says. After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. Although we know that Jesus Christ never baptized, it is his disciples that baptized really. And John also was baptizing in Ainon near to Salim, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. So we have two groups baptizing. Verse 24, for John was not yet cast into the prison. Verse 25, then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. Now, this purifying is what uh, uh, 
uh, uh, E.G. White later says that it's about um, uh, uh, the sanctification or uh, the cleansing of sin. And so, and they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptized, and all men come to him. And John answered and said, a man can receive nothing except it be given from heaven. And so John talks about he must decrease and Christ increase, but you find that uh, there was a question of uh, even the words and the mode of baptism when the question of purifying arose in the book of uh, uh, John chapter 3 <coughs> from verses 22, verses 25, and it is addressed in uh, 2SP 136.3, 2SP 136. Point three. Maybe I can just uh, find it and put it on the screen of what was happening at that point. 2SP 136.3. Uh, this is uh, maybe if we can see the screen, what it says, what's happening in 26. The prejudice of Jews aroused the disciples aroused because the disciples of Jesus did not use the exact words of John in the rite of baptism. Now, this information we are missing in other parts. The prejudice of the Jews was aroused because the disciples of Jesus did not use the exact words of John in the rite of baptism. So you find that the words that John was using were not the words that the disciples were using. And that is why. 19, they do not understand anything about the Holy Spirit, which means in the baptism of the apostle, something about the Holy Spirit was introduced. Sorry for that uh, interruption. So seeing that in the baptism of uh, John, you realize nothing of the Holy Spirit was spoken of. That is why when Paul meets the disciples of John in Acts chapter 19, he finds that they have no clue about the Holy Spirit, which means in the baptism of the disciples, something to do with the Holy Spirit was spoken of. Now, Sister White continues to say, John baptized and repentance. But the disciples of Jesus, on profession of faith, baptized in the name of the Father, <coughs> Son, and Holy Spirit. The teachings of John were in perfect harmony with those of Jesus. Yet his disciples became jealous for fear, uh, uh, for fear his influence was diminishing. A dispute arose between them and the disciples of Jesus in regarding to the form of words proper to use at baptism. So here we have an instance in the purifying we, we find that John is using other words and the disciples are using other words and there is a commotion. Uh, it says, at this arose between the, the disciples of Jesus in regard to the four words proper for use at baptism and finally as to the right of the latter to baptize at all if the disciples of uh, Jesus should baptize, we are using. Uh, I, I welcome somebody to say something as uh, we move quickly to the book of first John chapter five, seven. Okay. <clears throat> Hello. Hello. I think me. Okay. Hello. Yes, I can hear you, Elda. Kefa. All right. What I was saying is uh, actually on the baptism of in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. To me, I think it would be very difficult to use it because, uh, well, when I compare the, the in the whole Bible, uh, that is in the letters of Paul and many others. Let's, for example, in uh, Romans chapter 6, verse uh, 3. <clears throat> Romans 6, 3 says, uh, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Now, 
when someone is baptized into Jesus Christ, he is baptized into his death. Now here we are told to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. My question is, does, did the Holy Spirit die or did the Father die? Because baptism refers baptism into the death of Jesus Christ. And also when I look at First uh, Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1, we see that uh, Paul is speaking and saying that, uh, moreover, brethren, I could not, I could not that you should be ignorant who that or our fathers were under the crowd and all passed through the sea. First two. Uh, and were all baptized unto Moses in the crowd and in the sea. Now the Israelites, that is the fathers of the Israelites, were baptized unto Moses. Why? Because it's clear that Moses was the one who had saved them from Egypt unto Canaan, the promised land. And Jesus being our savior from this world to the heavenly Canaan, I want to think we are also baptized unto Christ Jesus as, uh, as we had seen in Romans 6, verse 3 and 4. Also in, uh, in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse uh, 10 and 11, we see that uh, Paul is, uh, is talking to them and he is asking them, why are they having disputes over and divisions uh, among themselves? Some are saying, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Paul, I'm of Kevas, and so on, and others are of Christ. But see Paul asking a question in verse 14. I thank God that I baptized none of you, but Crispus, no, no, verse 13 says, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Now, in this case, uh, it refers that the baptism is in the name. And in this case, we have seen it used several times in the name of Jesus Christ, that is the book of Acts. So, and again, uh, we cannot discuss this independently of history. History has it clearly that baptism in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit actually did not happen during the time of the, the disciples or during the early church, but it started uh, long after. Uh, it was an institution of the Roman Catholic Church. So I think, I think um, maybe unless there's some evidence where maybe the early church did it, then I'll accept it. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Elder Kefa. Uh, you mentioned one thing that uh, that really uh, you mentioned the book of Romans that uh, Christ could have for us, and so he is worthy of uh, uh, his name. We being baptized in his name. But uh, I, I like just to throw a challenge on you that um, although Christ is the one who was crucified, it was the Father who enabled him to endure actually the cross. And so Jesus Christ That's dying on the cross really doesn't uh, uh, bring an issue to me that uh, he is the one really worthy and not the Father or the Holy Spirit. Because look at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. The book of Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. Uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. It says, How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit? And so the son did not die of his own accord. He couldn't die of his own accord. If it were not the eternal spirit of the father in him, guiding him and uh, uh, making him be able to endure the cross, then his even death on the cross could have no meaning. And uh, uh, 
when Christ is dying on the cross, there is that divine sundering of the Father and the Son where he cries, uh, uh, my Father, my Father, why have you forsaken me? Uh, this uh, uh, also the book of Corinthians brings out that the Father was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And so uh, I tweet that the God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing uh, uh, trespasses upon us. And so you find that... Uh, the role that the father also played in the plan of redemption is greater than we can ever imagine. Maybe we just take it in a simplistic manner that Christ died on the cross, but without the eternal spirit of the father being able to be sundered at the cross, then the, the, the sacrifice is a human sacrifice. It is not an infinite sacrifice. Hello, I can add something. Yes, Brother Huntington. Uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening to you. Uh, now, uh, I would say, I would like to say, if, if we would, uh, and thank you, Brother Sami, for that addition you, you added on the, on the word name in Matthew 28, 19. If we would take that name to uh, mean not so much the individual now in characters, but but the authority or the power of God, uh, it would save us a lot. Because, uh, 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 brother Kefa, uh, my challenge with that position that it would be difficult to baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit is, uh, I mean, in SOP we don't find that annulled. Uh, Christ himself uh, is the one speaking in Matthew 28, uh, 19, and 20. Much as there have been uh, allusions that uh, uh, this was an added verse, but it is uh, to argue this out with, with an authority, Trinitarian. You know, how will you convince them that Paul is saying, uh, baptize into Christ, Christ is saying, baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So I'll follow Paul and not Christ. Yeah. Uh, so if, for me, uh, Matthew 28, 19, 20, we, we should leave it as it is. Let's understand that uh, that name translation is authority. And that would uh, just uh, settle that question uh, so much. Thanks. Uh Thank you so much. It's another issue uh, the beloved brother Kefa has uh, is that uh, uh, the, the baptism in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is an interpolation or something that was added by uh, uh, the, the Romans. But uh, I really challenge him to produce the evidence because there is also evidence contrary to that because it is just a statement one of the bishops really said, but. Uh, it is, uh, I haven't found evidence. In fact, uh, there the, is the charge that uh, it, it, uh, uh, we people in the end months to Matthew before the third century AD, but it was added after the third century. Um, one thing that you have realized that, that there is no Greek manuscript of the last page of Matthew that does not include these words, none, not a single one. Uh, I'd like to challenge you to bring an evidence for that. Number two, the words are found in every old Latin, Vetus Latina Itala, that uh, date before the Vulgate, which is the oldest uh, uh, maybe uh, a translation that we can ever have, uh, which uh, is connected with the Romans. This includes the Waldensian text type of the Romount, they are also found in the Vulgate manuscript. The words are found in every Aramaic Syrias, uh, Syriac edition, including uh, uh, Tatian's Diatessaron uh, Gospel Harmony from the second century, which is likely based off the old uh, and uh, the only outlier is a very late group dated. 1385 AD of Matthew that we, uh, we can uh, be able to examine if uh, uh, time allows us. But um, to say that uh, it is 
uh, we have really to uh, get a grip on the evidence that um, we have and uh, if uh, you have that evidence we are here for one week we will be blessed by having them but uh, contrarily there are jane andrews has done a, a good study on these things and uh, how baptism was done in the old time uh, by the people like justinian and um, uh, who else the, the bishops that were before that uh, and, and so uh, i'll challenge you maybe we, we can find uh, uh, in a uh, in 50 to 90 AD CE, actually we have a Didac also baptizing in the formula of uh, Matthew chapter uh, 28 verse 19, found just in Matthias, the first apologetic in uh, 155 AD, also baptizing in the same. We find also Tashian that Soron 175 baptizing in the same. They, there's a lot of evidence, and uh, I'm just looking at the evidence. Irenaeus against heresies in 198. This is way before the third century and the fourth century. And um, uh, they are quoting the Bibles that they had and baptizing people at such a time and uh, really quoting Matthew chapter 28. Tertullian also and uh, baptized in the same. And Tertullian, you know, he existed in 216 AD. Uh, which is way before the third century and fourth century where we find that the Roman came into power uh, and uh, uh, it is purported that they changed uh, uh, the gospels. We also find uh, Hippolytus uh, baptizing in the same, this is 230 AD. I have a quite number of evidence, origin also in, on the commentary in 244 AD was able to baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit quoting the book of Matthew chapter 28 verse 19. Also, Polsina uh, uh, was able to baptize in the same. And so th there's really a lot of evidence for Matthew chapter 28 verse 19 against the statement of a bishop that uh, it was added there. Gregory also in 250 AD was able to quote Matthew chapter 28 verse 19. And, uh, Many, many more. If uh, uh, also we have Cyprian of uh, Jubianus uh, in 256 AD, I, I can say that uh, have evidence after evidence that before the third century and the fourth century, we had people who are baptizing that. We have an excellent history done by Jane Andrews and uh, another brother called Brendan Nadison. And so it makes unto us that uh, uh, can we compare the evidence that we are having, maybe what you have and what other peoples have, if uh, there was any uh, 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 there was any baptism done before the third and fourth century in the name of the Father uh, and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Yes, Elder Kefa, welcome. Uh, 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 I want to ask, that is yes. in Colossians 3.17. Colossians? It says... 317. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Uh, yes. uh, what, what, what I'm asking is that uh, in this verse, we are told in whatsoever we do in word or in deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus. And I think uh, actually this is what the disciples did when we follow in uh, the book of Acts chapter 2, verse 38, you go down chapter 4, uh, chapter 8, chapter 19. It's talking about baptism in the name of Jesus. And uh, all these others is history. And okay. one of the, the biggest some... driver, one of, hello? Yes, continue. Yeah, I'm saying mm -hmm. one of these biggest libraries where the sources of these uh, many archives of the old books I found is actually in Rome. That's where you can even find all those manuscripts 
And we understand from the book and lightings 220, N.G. White says that uh, actually God had taken care of his word, but when its copies were few, some people went in and did changes there so that it can lean towards their tradition and uh, their own uh, teachings. So if we say that this one is not an interpretation and it's not actually an addition, I fail to understand which verse was added in the Bible. And this maybe we can be able to cite a few because N.T. had said it was interfered with. Uh, thank you so much. Um, maybe Elda gave that. And uh, you see, when E.G. White says that uh, when Bibles were few, men tried to correct it and uh, they added some things. She doesn't say Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. It is on our own maybe thinking that uh, we come to that conclusion that uh, uh, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 is what uh, she's talking about. But she doesn't say which one. In fact, she goes ahead and quotes Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. This is something that uh, maybe we should ask ourselves if the prophet who was being inspired directly by God could go and quote Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, and even give an evidence in John chapter 3 that the disciples were baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now we are left with only one thing. Either we believe her or uh, we dismiss her or we choose what to believe in her writing and what not to believe. That uh, really brings in a crisis with the spirit of prophecy. Uh, and uh, I'd like to show something on screen, maybe. And I knew that uh, this, uh, this thing will take uh, some time when it comes to uh, uh, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. But uh, I, I love the Lord because he would like us to just discuss it amicably. What we are talking about uh, Catholic changing is in formula. Uh, I want us to see what the Encyclopedia Volume 2, page 263 says. The baptistic formula was changed from the name of Jesus Christ to the words of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit by the Roman, the Catholic Church in the second century. Now, one thing to know that this statement is the formula used in baptism not to the text being added. There are some things when we read, we have to understand what is being spoken of. Formula, they say they change, but they doesn't say that actually the text was not there and it was added or something of that kind. And this uh, to we have seen that the words of Matthew chapter 28, 19 were not originally a formula and that this later development of card second and third as charges. So uh, when we look at this quote, by the words of the text is being referred to in the quote is not the text of 2019, but the apostles' creed, not the discussion leading immediately up to above quote. So when uh, in that way that the words of Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 was added. It only talks about the Apostle Creed and what they were doing. But uh, uh, to say that uh, Encyclopedia had the text or uh, uh, did such a thing, it's even to go against what uh, the Encyclopedia itself says. Hello. I think who is a Catholic actually one of his citations talks about the the text being there from uh, so something to think about. Maybe some closing remarks. I don't know. We won't be able to go to John 1 John 5 because time is slipping from hand.
Hello. Uh, Brother Sami. Hello. I was saying there's something that uh, Elder Kefa talked about that everything you do, do it in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, I, I just welcome us to, if we have anything, please, can we share on that? Hello. Yes, Brother Huntington? Yeah, maybe just uh, uh, not, uh, a thought on the same. Uh, doing everything in the name of Christ. I want to believe that uh, has connection with 1 Corinthians 10, 31, that whatsoever we do, whether we eat or drink or whatsoever else we do, we do the glory of God. Uh, on the one hand, that uh, whatever we do, we exalt Christ. But on the other hand, uh, in relation to heaven, is that... Uh, all that we say and think and do is acceptable before the Father only on account of Christ. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, I like just start who are not uh, are speaking to mute themselves. On addition on that, yes. Yes, I did. I, I like just to add on that, that uh, we do in the in the name of Jesus. And uh, but uh, when you go to John chapter four verse twenty four, it says, "God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must uh, uh, must worship Him in spirit and uh, in truth." And so. Even though that uh, everything we do in Jesus Christ, can do in the name of Jesus Christ without control of the Holy Spirit. That is why in Galatians, I'll request Brother Kefa to mute. Elder Kefa, can you mute yourself? So, even though everything we do, it is the name of the, of the Son, Jesus Christ, but we do it in the Spirit. And without that Spirit, then we can do, we can do it in the name of Jesus. And so, without the controlling power of the Holy Spirit, we are not able to do anything. And remember also in Galatians chapter 4, verse 32, we are told that grieve not the Holy Spirit. And so, if we do anything, even doing Christ, doing contrary to the leading of the Holy Spirit, we will be giving the Spirit, and that is another point. If we give the Holy Spirit, we are really just giving the Father and the Son because it is there. Uh, spirit. But in the book of uh, Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, we told that in their affliction, in their in their affliction. This is Isaiah 63. In their affliction, he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence in his heart and in his kingdom, and he bare them and carried all them all the days of all. But 
they rebelled and vexed his holy spirit therefore he was turned to the enemy he forced them and so we see that uh, although things are done in the name of the son the holy spirit is involved in this because being the spirit of the father and the son in everything that we do uh, 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 it is the spirit indicting what we do galatians 4 6 says that uh, uh, and because you are sons that uh, the father has sent the spirit of the son in your hearts crying abba father so without even the indicting of the holy spirit there is nothing we can do in the name of the son that can be accepted also in romans chapter 8 we are told that we do not know how to pray but uh, the spirit maketh intercession for us and so you see the connection of the father the son and the holy spirit the triad is complete only when we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Without the, the Spirit, then the triad is not complete because they are in heaven physically, located in heaven on their throne, but uh, they are with us in their omnipresence. And uh, 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 maybe lastly, something to contribute is uh, in, uh, in the book of Corinthians, which says that uh, no one be led by the spirit of the son cursed actually uh, the son. And so uh, I see the interconnection of uh, the triad in every other place in the Bible, not only in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, but uh, also Paul says that uh, I'll sing in the spirit, but I'll sing with my mind also. And so there is always that connection of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and this doesn't bring in the idea that uh, these three are uh, 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 the, the third. The third one is uh, another person and connected to the Father and the Son. Maybe we may have some closing remarks on this. Welcome, Brother Collins Rao. Okay, thank you. Um, I am um, fine. I'm welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Brother Dickens, okay. Welcome. Thank you. Sorry, I was late. <laughs> ask another yeah. question, though. I don't have a problem. What would be if a Trinitarian is putting that? What does he mean in his mind? And if we are putting that, what do we mean in the mind? Uh, but I think uh, there should be no much controversy over that. That is what I, I wanted to ask. Uh, thank you. And uh, maybe something that ha has just come into my mind as uh, we were speaking about this uh, and uh, it is uh, in uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 4, as we wrap up this, talking about uh, how the Holy Spirit participates in all this. Romans chapter 6, verse 4 says, Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. I want you to notice what it's saying, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also walk in newness of life. You find the triad also there. We have Jesus Christ. We are buried with him in baptism unto death. That is Jesus Christ. And then we are raised by the glory of the Father. So we have the Father and the glory of the Father. You also find that in baptism, all the three are actually uh, mentioned. That is the, the Son, and we have the Father and the glory of the Father, which is the Holy Spirit. And, so, and this touches on baptism. Just right there in uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 4, you find it touching on the on, on Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, going into the world and baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, 
And now we find in this baptism that uh, uh, the death is the death of the son, and then we are raised by the glory of uh, the father, and it is the father who raises us. Uh, because we find when you continue reading Romans chapter eight, you'll find that it is the father who raised Jesus Christ by his glory. And so we die into the death of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit raises us into newness of life, but it is the very act of the father who commissions all these things to happen. And so I, I'd like to thank all of us. We didn't even touch on uh, first John chapter five, verses seven. Uh, which is another text that uh, we should be looking at. But uh, maybe my last question before um, uh, we close up. Uh, how will you now interact with the E.G. White's writing, which really quotes Matthew chapter 28, verse 19? Will you say that she didn't have inspiration? She didn't know what happened or... Uh, as Seventh-day Adventist, how will we explain that Sister White quoting Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, and even the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the pioneers baptizing uh, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit uh, back in 1840s? How will we relate to that? Just maybe everyone of us can say something. I'm starting with the Dickens. How, how will you relate with that? the issue of E.G. White quoting Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, and also the pioneers baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. How will you relate with that? Yeah, thank you, brother. <coughs> Before I did much study on the same, I was also posing it, but when I came to realize that uh, <coughs> the text was there since, I don't have a problem with it. And... Uh, before that, I was even tempted to realize that maybe it was edited in SOP, but when I came to learn that it is truth and I knew the meaning of Matthew 28, 19, I don't have problem with it and uh, I don't have with problem with what the SOP is saying about it. Even though before I had a challenge, but when I came keenly studying, because you know they are... <coughs> There is a tendency when we see uh, a quote in a Sufi which is not going well with what we believe, we tend to think that they have been edited. But I thought that that is not the reality. <clears throat> we should study this thing one by one and see the, even the original manuscript and see the, how they are used, and even the Bible, the way they have been seeing, the way you have explained it is okay. <clears throat> right now, I don't have a problem with it, but uh, about 2018, I had a problem. 2019 I had a problem, but last year I came to study about it. I don't have a problem with it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Brother Huntington, uh, maybe uh, if you find somebody who will be opposing uh, the book of Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, uh, just without mentioning the SOP, how will you be able to reconcile with such a brother, Brother Huntington? Is uh, Brother Huntington is still with us? M maybe I should go to Elder Kefa if uh, Brother Huntington is not uh, ready to speak. Brother Kefa, now. Hello. Uh, yes, Brother Huntington, I was asking. Yeah. Uh, that. Um, uh, how will you reconcile with a brother maybe who doesn't see Matthew chapter 28 verse 19 as an original text and uh, doesn't feel comfortable uh, using the book of Matthew chapter 28 verse 19, knowing what uh, it says and what SOP says? Well, uh, in essence, those are the words of Christ. And if, if we, uh, don't, we, we will have issues with the words of Christ, then I do not know what else we will not have issues with. And uh, for me, I would want this brother to really explain uh, his take on Revelation 22, uh, last verses. You know, where we are bidden 
not to take away anything from uh, Holy Writ. So in, in having a problem with that, uh, it, it would be suggesting we don't use it. It would be suggesting take it away. Where Martin Luther was in the book of James, you know? Yeah. And so uh, that is as if we take scripture to be entire authority, then we we will uh, subscribe to every verse of scripture, really. Unless uh, and if we want to take away some portions, then we should be ready for the consequences described in Revelation 22 of someone adding or moving. Thank you, Brother Huntington. My other question goes to Brother Collins. Uh, the book of Matthew, chapter 28, verse 19, uh, the people who said that uh, it was changed when you look at some uh, information, they say that it should uh, be in Matthew, chapter 28, verse 2, that uh, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go ye teach and baptize in the name of Jesus, and lo, I am always with you till the end of the age. Uh, uh, I don't know how you view that, uh, Brother Collins Rao, that uh, actually verses 19 uh, in people say that go baptize in the name of Jesus and I'm always with you till the end of the age. Do you see that it lacks the weight uh, that uh, is there when actually it is read the way it is in the Bible right now? I I like to hear your view on that, Brother Collins. Hello, I, 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 I believe we should take the Bible as it is and not try to find out uh, whether it is not full in its context. In as much as it is said that a little here, a little there, add a flesh to the scripture. I so believe that it is Christ himself who mentioned these words. Eh? And therefore he knew that uh, at one moment, uh, he will not physically appear uh, to the people. So I so believe that uh, uh, it doesn't add any less of, of the of the vitality of the gospel upon which the upon which Christ mentioned. So for me, I do not have much expansion. Though uh, I would love uh, I would love to to hear also from my brothers what they like. You can say that he had a, a problem with that, but finally came in 2018 and realized. What did he realize out of the text uh, that uh, now changed him? He just said that he had a, a problem, but he came to a realization of uh, in around 2018. So for me, I, I what I have said, I think, uh, uh, is what I currently understand. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe, Brother Dickens, can you respond to that in uh, some two minutes? Yeah, thank you. What were you struggling with, and what did you come to realize that put you on ground with that text? Yeah, you know, before, when I was reading the comment, uh, the word that Trinitarians are using, then I thought that now being non-Trinitarian, not believing in Trinity, using the same words would... Uh, interfere with my faith. I went on searching, and again, I heard from other brethren saying that uh, that text was edited, and even in SOP, it wasn't used. But when I was reading deep, I realized that it is used several times in SOP, and even <clears throat> another brother, I think Andrew, has used it also. So I came to, to study King, then I realized that that, thing, that text has got nothing to do with the Trinity. It is a commission. And again, when we are talking about the three powers of heaven, it doesn't mean that these three are gods and they are, they, they, they are one. Uh, so when I came to realize this I, uh, after much study, because when I, I, I first read it in SOP, but a brother was telling me that it wasn't used, so I was shocked. Then I went to read further, then I realized that it, it has been used more than once in SOP. And even Jane Andrew has used it. So, so due to that, I realized that I need to study more concerning the same and put now when I'm putting that that verse, my mind should not be 
a mind of a Trinitarian because I know now what the text means. That is what I meant that before, in fact, it's just last year when I was studying much is when I came to realize that the text had got nothing to do with Trinity and we should not be much troubled when mentioning the three, uh, the, uh, the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in baptism. <clears throat> it has got nothing to do with Trinity. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Dickens. Maybe uh, Brother Timothy, yes, as brother. Uh, we... Okay. Well, somebody speaking? Brother Timothy Okini, you are uh, the second last person. Maybe I'm posing a question to you. The book of Matthew, chapter 28, verse 19, go ye baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses, the, the book of Romans, chapter 6, uh, chapter 6, verses 4, that uh, we die in Christ, then we are raised by the glory of the Father, which is the Holy Spirit. Do you, is there a connection between these two texts, or it will be a far fetch to say that uh, really Romans chapter 6, verse 4, which talks about baptism, uh, it ties together with uh, uh, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Brother Timothy King. Oh, uh, thank you very much uh, for the presentation today. I hope you are getting me. Yes, I'm getting you. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, oh, there is a connection from uh, the way I view things, especially as regards to the regeneration process. As in, uh, when someone submits to Christ, then like uh, the spirit of God is sent into their hearts and that is the transformational power and in that spirit there is all the attributes of God which are righteousness and so Matthew 28 19 says that go and baptize in the name and uh, the word name like means the character as in like uh, when Moses was in the mount and uh, God and God told him like he will make all his glory to pass before him, and he saw the character of God. And so for me, like when I view Matthew twenty eight nineteen vis a vis uh, uh, Romans chapter six, uh, I see that connection that baptizing in the name is like wh what is the emphasis is on the name, and so like it means that the character of Christ is going to be. Is going to be imbued on this person who is going through the baptismal process as in romans chapter six and so uh from that angle is where i see a connection otherwise uh i think i'll need more time to think about the two verses that you have post anyway thank you thank you so much lastly brother elder kefa maybe uh my no, question brother just, uh, would be, yes brother Collins. yeah brother Sammy, uh, i just wanted to ask the question Yes. Uh, because, you know, I, I was not there when people started, eh? Yes. Yeah, so I just wanted to ask then, according to the explanations that I'm getting, eh? Could it, mm -hmm. could it therefore not suffice when Christ himself would have mentioned that, baptized in the name of the Father and the Son, would that not suffice? Because also in the, that, there's a character. The character of God we know is righteousness. The character of, I mean, of, of the Father we know is righteousness. And we know also the character of, of Christ is righteousness. So will that not suffice that if Christ mentioned that go and baptize in the name of the Father and the Son, will that not suffice? Yeah, th there is a good, uh, good view, Brother Collins. It suffices uh, to me because when, when we were studying the, the, the sessions on Christ uh, and his righteousness or righteousness by faith, we found that um, Christ did not have his own righteousness but uh, Christ had the righteousness of the Father because he says that I did not come to do my will, but the will of my Father. And then we know that uh, Christ could ha have not gone through the garden of uh, temptation if the Father's righteousness was not in him. Um, and uh, which text was I looking at? I think it should be in uh, the book of uh, Ephesians, which talks about uh, uh, the righteousness of God revealed in the Son. 
Now, Jesus Christ is getting the righteousness from the Father. And then, because uh, 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 he gives us the spirit, the spirit gives us that righteousness. So you can see that conduit of, um, of uh, channeling of that righteousness. The Father gives to the Son, uh, as the Father has the life in himself, so he has given the Son to have life in himself. And so the very life of the Father that has given to the Son, it is the very life that we are given. And that life is uh, where Second Peter 1 4 says that we become partakers of divine nature. And so when we are talking about uh, being baptized in the name of the Father, we are being, I think you make a good point that uh, it is the righteousness, the totality of the righteousness of the Father. And uh, to me, uh, I can say by myself that uh, it really suffices what you are talking about. My, my last question was going to uh, Elder uh, Kefa. We only have two minutes, maybe. Uh, Elder Kefa, what uh, now will you do with, uh, or how will you approach the whole thing, seeing that uh, Sister White quotes Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, and the pioneers of the church quotes Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Uh, uh, how will you reconcile with the issue that it is uh, an interpolation? If somebody had an issue that uh, it is an interpolation, how will you reconcile with the, the prophetess and the pioneers as we pray, Elder Kefa? Okay, okay thank you. Uh, I'd like to say that uh, I'm left wondering still. Yes. The event you had said that uh, the Bible could be interfered with. What about our writings? That's the question. But uh, I can see, and I'm comforted from what I read in GC 246.2, it says only by the Bible could men arrive at the truth. You see, if we start arguing on Matthew 28, verse 19, and then we go to Spirit of Proverbs, and then we talk about the Bible, we are going to confuse ourselves. Here, these are two different books. We have the Spirit of Proverbs and we have the Bible. And then Chua is advising that only by the Bible could men arrive at the truth. In GC 595.1, we... Oh, we lost Elder Kefa. He's muted. Maybe Elder Kefa, if you are still speaking, you can unmute yourself. Hello? I, can yes, you hear me? I can get you now. Yes, now. Oh, all right, I was reading from Great Controversy. Hello? Yes, go ahead. That's five, five paragraph one. That, but God will have a people upon the earth to maintain the Bible and the Bible only as the standard of all doctrines and the basis of all reforms. You see, if uh, I'm faced with a question, maybe whether Matthew 28, 19 is an interpretation, then I rather use the Bible alone and try to see if really it is an interpretation or not. For Jesus is giving a command and we do believe that these are the words of Jesus. Our question is, we go to the acts of the apostles. The apostles are implementing what Jesus had told them. And we see them doing it in the name of Jesus alone. Now the question is, whom am I to come later? What is not, what is not done by the disciples? Because what we must do is what actually Jesus said or did, what the disciples did or all said, and what the prophets did. And again, not forgetting Isaiah 28.10. It says here, retro, there, retro, line upon line. If we only take one first, that Matthew 28, 19, I say that is the truth, and then we stick there. What do we do about these several verses, which, which are talking strictly about baptism being done by the disciples and done in the name of Christ? That is the question I have. Oh, I, I like your question. And uh, talking about the book of Acts, I think uh, the only records of baptism done are. Uh, are, uh, uh, that we are told that they were done in the name of Jesus are two baptisms, 
uh, by two apostles. That is uh, the apostles Peter and uh, yeah. the, the the apostle uh, Paul. Those are the yeah, only people who are doing baptism in the book of uh, the book of Acts. But uh, you don't and find Philip. the other. Huh? Philip. Philip did baptism. Oh. Uh, Philip did baptism, but uh, you, you remember when Philip says that uh, he believed in the son and then uh, he baptized the, the, the eunuch, but uh, we are not told. Uh, 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 in fact, it is uh, in the book of uh, Acts chapter 8, just as we pray. It is threatening even to rain here. In Acts chapter 8, verse 38, and he commanded the chariot, uh, verse 37, and Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest, and he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. So you find the two are mentioned, Jesus Christ and God himself. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And... Uh, they were come, and when they were come out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught away Philip. And so we find the father is mentioned, the son is mentioned, and also the Holy Spirit. But in other instances, you are seeing Paul and Peter baptized. They are only the two disciples that really baptized, but we are not told of the other baptism. And so it will be dangerous also to say that all the other disciples baptized in the name of Jesus, because we don't have uh, the record of their baptism. My challenge maybe to you, Elder Kefa, will be, why did uh, Paul in Acts chapter 19 ask the disciples of John if they, ever ha have, they had ever heard something about the Holy Spirit? Really, if you study the context of Acts chapter 19, do you find that uh, there is something or some teaching that the disciples of John were lacking that Paul had to introduce to them before they were baptized, and it is in connection with the Holy Spirit. And this gives a hint of the Holy Spirit being part of uh, the baptism. Are you still there? Yeah, I'm there. Are you getting me? Yeah, I'm getting you. Okay, what I'm saying is that uh, actually, well, in Matthew chapter 19, where Paul is speaking, we see, we are, we are actually told that uh, he baptized them in the name of Jesus, and then laying the hands on them, thus afterwards, they received the Holy Ghost. So here, actually, the baptism is mentioned is in the name of Jesus. So well, the spirit is connected, but in the baptism, we are told he baptized them in the name of of Jesus Christ. We are not told whether he baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of the Father, and the name of the Holy Ghost. Well, we are seeing the Holy Spirit being connected by uh, maybe saying they received the Holy Ghost after he had placed his hands on them. So I don't know, but I still need to do more such. Maybe we'll be my, my, discussing later. Okay, thank you. My question was in verse 2 of Acts chapter 19. He said unto them, yeah. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, we have not so much as had whether there be any uh, Holy Ghost, meaning that uh, they, they didn't have any teaching on the Holy Ghost and uh, to be baptized. Don't you think that uh, they had to be taught about the Holy Ghost if they had never heard about it? Well, that's true. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank you so much, everyone, for participating. I talked so much. It, I didn't want to talk so much. To, to, tomorrow, we shall be looking at, uh, are there any edits in SOP and how do we deal with them? I think I'll shelve one. Brother, what, 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 what's the conclusion now of this? Nene? What's the conclu conclusion? Sorry, Brother Sami. What is the conclusion? Because like, uh, according to my, my evaluation, there are so many uncertainties yet. So what is the conclusion of, of this now? Are we moving it? Uh, are we having it another time? Ama is concluded now. No, Brother Collins, we are not having it concluded. 
Yeah. But uh, we were discussing the, the reason for having a panel is people to bring in their views and how they see the text and how mm. we can um, work in harmony and in oneness. And so there is uh, a lot to be read in history. There's a lot to understand in, uh, in the Bible when you come to Hebrew parallelism and the chiastic structures that are found in the Bible and little here and a little there. Uh, Maybe in, uh, I can just say that um, for me, I have never had uh, an issue with Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, understanding that it's not a Trinitarian text and from the history being confirmed that it was quoted by those who baptized before the second century. And so it is not something that uh, I find a problem. And um, you see, I believe that E.G. White is a prophet and uh, the same spirit that inspired the word of God also inspired her writings. And so both canonical and un uncanonical uh, inspiration are by of one spirit. And I cannot run away from that unless it is proved that uh, actually E.G. White's writing on Matthew chapter 28 verse 19 were edited. And that is what we are going to look at tomorrow that uh, does her writing, were her writings edited concerning such a things that we are speaking about? But uh, if uh, we go by what Elder Kefa said that the Bible and the Bible alone, I have no problem with it. Matthew chapter 28 verse 19 meets it is fulfillment also in Romans chapter 6 verse 4, where we have the baptism in the death of the son. We have the rising in the glory of the father, which is the Holy Spirit and then the father doing the resurrection. And so I see a lot of parallelism in the Bible and uh, from history, there is only one citation where the bishop says that the formula was changed, but that citation in encyclopedia doesn't say that the text was added. That is what I was saying. When we are reading history, we should understand what it's saying and what it's not saying. It doesn't say that the text was added, but it says that the formula, which is the apostolic creed was changed. And so we have to ask ourselves, what was the apostles doing? And if they are saying it's not the text which was added, then we should be comfortable with the text itself, seeing that uh, it aligns well with uh, Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, and uh, Matthew chapter 28, verses 20. I don't know, uh, Brother Collins, what you, you had in mind. No, I don't have much in mind yet, but I'm also just trying to explore more about this subject and this text, especially otherwise thinking. And so, thank you so much. Uh, I, I just to to on top of what E.G. White says that uh, that uh, the Bible is our creed and only the Bible will lead us into the right uh, doctrinal uh, issues. She also says that uh, the lesser light or uh, the spirit of prophecy was given to correct errors. And so if the spirit of prophecy was given to correct errors and we know that the Lord used Sister White and she has commentaries on the text and on the other text, then uh, I think the best thing should be, we, we will have to humble ourselves and just accept she is inspired. If we will find that uh, the text uh, that she uses, her writings were not edited as we shall be looking at tomorrow, then uh, we should humble ourselves and uh, be able to accept that uh, the text was there. And when she uses it, she uses it under inspiration. We shall be looking at length, uh, some editing in E.G. White's writing and uh, if that um, Matthew chapters 28 verse 19 in her writing were actually edited. Otherwise, I'd like us to pause there and uh, be able to meet tomorrow uh, or uh, during the daylight from five to seven when we shall be looking is SOP edited somehow. I'd like uh, us to close with a word of prayer. Maybe Brother Huntington, if you are still with us, you can uh, close with a word of prayer. Shall we pray? 
our loving Father and Most High God in heaven. Glory, praise, and honor be unto your holy name. We appreciate and thank you for the opportunity to get together as brethren on uh, this uh, virtual platform and to discuss uh, the, your holy scriptures. Uh, we appreciate for this initiative uh, by the Gospel Sounders for this one week. And we pray, O King of Glory, that indeed uh, through this uh, virtual sessions, we will be able to come up with a formidable way forward in uh, advancing your gospel course. We are living in momentous moments and uh, a lot needs to be done in but a very short time. We pray, O King of Glory, that you will help us uh, see, uh, sense the urgency of the moment and the need to unite our efforts and further your gospel course to a final triumph. Grant us a blessed night's rest as we part company until the appointed time tomorrow is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless Amen. you, brethren, and uh, those who are watching from various places, God bless you until um, 5 p.m. during the daybreak. Uh, may you have all blessed night and those who are waking up in different parts of the world, good morning to you, everyone. Otherwise, bye for now. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.